I think the M80 Firecracker is the weapon of choice. Oh, what are you going to do with that? Well, I think you have to um, shove it down the front of her dress <laughs> and set it off, because otherwise, how are you going to get rid of it? Hey, I'm James A. Janice, and some of you may know me as Dead Meat. If you do, you probably already know that I love to watch people die. You know, like on screen. I've always wanted to talk to the horror legends who put those kills on screen and find out what scares them, and also if they could survive their favorite kill scenes. This is Meetup. Today's guest, director and Gremlins creator, Joe Dante. Hi, Hi. Joe. I'm Hi. James. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, welcome back to another episode of Meetup. I'm James A. Janice, and today I'm here with Joe Dante, who has done so much marvelous work. And, Thank you. And we've got the meat for Meetup. <laughs> That's right. Uh, food's here. It's from Lala's. Yep, we, uh, we ordered the best out. one, which is Pachuca Dijon. Ooh. It's the best thing they have. And uh, Lala's is a Argentinian grill from... Uh, it's in Studio City. I've, I've well, gone there. There's one here in Hollywood. Oh, this is from the Hollywood. This would really be cold if it came from Studio City. That's what I thought. Yeah. Horror fans might best know you for Piranha or Gremlins, but your your career has spanned a lot of different genres and a lot of different uh, films. But they all have that kind of fun play to them. They're kind of fantastical. I like the genre. And um, when you start out in the in, in something and it works, then they tend to tell you that we like you to make more of those. Mm -hmm. But it's fine with me because I, I'm, I enjoy these pictures. Yeah, and I've, I've heard uh, various other people kind of complain or like it rubs them the wrong way that they get kind of pigeonholed into the genre. But uh, even though you say you're fine with it, it, it does seem like you've been able to break out of it a little bit. You well, haven't yeah, because, just done horror. You know, I got, because I think horror and comedy are kind of uh, allied and uh, some of my favorite comedies are horror pictures and uh, vice versa. What um, what are some of your favorites like that? Well, everybody always says Apple and Costello made Frankenstein. I mean, of course. That's, the, that's the one that, that that blends all the stuff that scared you when you were a kid with the things that made you laugh when you were a kid. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember watching the James Whale movies uh, on uh, MT, like The Invisible Man, where you know The Invisible Man's obviously crazy and he does a lot of weird, crazy things and that are sort of funny. But then in the middle of it, he'll like hit, hit somebody over the head with a stool and kill them. It's just sort of, you, your laugh kind of catches in your throat. Yeah. And a, a laugh in the right place is a relaxer, and, and you can scare people a lot more easily if they're relaxed. Roger Corman, uh, would it be fair to say like you started your career with him? I wouldn't have a career for working for Roger Corman. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and, I'm, and I'm not the only one who could say that. There's a whole generations of, of people in, uh, in Hollywood whose career wouldn't exist if it wasn't for working for Roger. Because you made movies that were under the radar for not much money. You learned all these problem-solving ticks that you, you know, wouldn't get otherwise. And, mm -hmm. and because you had to have a movie at the end of your 10 days or whatever it was that you got <laughs> to shoot it. And then it, and it got released, which was fairly terrifying. And so many of the people who went through the Corman School became Academy Award winners and became the pillars of the industry. And Roger is still going. He's 92. I had lunch with him yesterday. Oh, wow. And he just doesn't show any signs of quitting. He's still making movies. That's so good to hear. I love hearing that. You began by editing some stuff for him, right? Editing trailers and... Uh... Yeah, I started in the trailer department, mm -hmm. uh, which is a great way to learn how to make movies because you have to take every scene and reduce it down to its components. Uh, you take a three-minute scene and you've got to reduce it down to 30 seconds. And, then you, and in doing that, you start to realize, well, you don't really need that angle at all. You could go from here to here. All of those things are in your head when you finally get a chance to direct a movie. Mm -hmm. And so instead of wasting time shooting angles that you don't need and covering the scenes as if every, every angle and every shot and every actor is going to be important, you do what you need to do in order to be able to uh, make it work. Did you ever edit any of your own features? Uh, yes, I started, I started out editing my own picture, Hollywood Boulevard, which I co-directed with Alan Arkish, and he also mm -hmm. co-edited it with me. And then I did Piranha, which I was one of the editors on, and I did The Howling, which I was one of the editors on. But I discovered when I got into the studio business that to give the director the power of editing his own movie mm -hmm. is really, in their eyes, giving him a little too much power. Yeah. And so uh, it's like you're not, you're, they, they feel that you're not really the best judge of what it is that you've shot. So it's better to have someone else do it. Yeah, you have this tendency to, to blend genres. Uh, Gremlins is, it's like, what kind of movie is this even? Is it a kids movie? Is it a holiday movie, a comedy, a horror? And I, I always appreciate that. I'm fine with ambiguity. I'm fine with things not being put into boxes, but. Uh, well, if you obviously don't run a studio. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Or. How do you respond to people trying to tell you to 
make things that are more one or the other, which I'm assuming. I mean, you know, nobody wants to be dictated to. On the other hand, you know, uh, uh, these people are spending a great deal of money and they have a market and they have ways of doing business and stuff and you want to make them happy. In the case of Gremlins, which was made for Steven Spielberg, who was very accommodating in, uh, to letting directors make their own movies. Once the time comes to show it to the studio, the studio was totally confused by the movie. They just didn't get it. They didn't understand. They think the grounds are so ugly and they blow their nose on the curtains and it's like, well, why can't they all be like Gizmo? Why can't they just be all be cute and blah, blah, blah. And part of the success of that movie um, is due entirely to Spielberg's insistence that even at, at the last minute, like a month before we started shooting, that Gizmo does not turn into Stripe the bad gremlin. Gizmo stays Gizmo for the entire movie. And that character, I think, led parents into thinking that this was going to be E.T. too. Mm, yeah. Once, once the grumblings came out, <laughs> uh, a lot of the parents were uh, annoyed and disturbed, and particularly when they went into the microwave. Yeah, I was going to bring that up, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, so the, and so the studio was not pleased with this stuff, and they just said, there's just too many grumblings. And so Spielberg said, I think correctly, said, well, why don't we just cut out all the grumblings and we'll call it people? <laughs> But nobody's going to go see it. But again, the, 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 the benefit of working for Spielberg was that you make, the director makes this movie and that's the version of the movie that gets previewed. But if we had done to the movie what they wanted to do with the movie, it, we'd be, wouldn't be talking about yeah. that movie at all anymore. Yeah, there wouldn't be dozens of gizmos around your house. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, now's the fun and game segment of this show. It's fun? There's, well, hopefully. Fingers crossed, yeah. <laughs> Before we started, we had you give us three of your favorite horror movies. But the movie that I chose for this game was The Horror of Dracula, also known as Dracula. And this was the first Hammer film, uh, Dracula, right? It was the first Hammer Dracula. It followed the success of The Curse of Frankenstein, and it led the rather small company onto a whole new path of making gothic horror movies and the Dracula adaptation is particularly interesting in that there wasn't a lot of money and they cleverly wrote in material saying that it's a common fallacy yeah that people think yeah they hang a lampshade on it they're like no we can't do that that's <laughs> yes, not what they do at all <laughs> um and it's also a very sexy movie and it, it set a, it set a tone and a template for all the, the pictures that followed it. And it's and it's it's efficient. It's well done. It's beautifully photographed. That's a terrific movie. Yeah, watching it, it's it's actually shocking that it was made in '58. Yeah. And it's got such like vivid colors, and it's you know a little more extreme than you might expect to come out of the '50s. No, it was a, it was a big hit. It was that, that was that we really put them on the map. Well, uh, hopefully you understand Dracula because we're gonna put you in it for this little segment that involves. The Chum Bucket. Why, have you had that all along? I have, I have. You've been hiding it. I had the Lala's delivery guy drop it off with me. <laughs> Inside here has a bunch of index cards with random items on it. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna have you do is draw three of them, and then I'm gonna put you in the place of Jonathan Harker, actually, in one of the scenes from Dracula, and you're gonna tell me what you would do in his position, but unlike him, you'll have these three items to work with. All right, so let's see what you draw out here. A rusty corkscrew, a broom handle, an M80 firecracker. Okay. So this is a scene earlier on in the movie, and it's when Jonathan Harker, he's staying overnight there, and he ran into this woman earlier who was asking him to help her. And he, at the time, he was like, I can't help you right now. But after, after getting settled in, he comes downstairs and is looking around the castle, and he runs into her again. He finally agrees to help her, and that's when she goes for his neck. Now, you're Jonathan Harker. What are you going to do? Have I been bitten yet? You have not been bitten yet. I think that probably the broom handle isn't going to help me. Okay. The rusty corkscrew, if I have it in my pocket, mm -hmm. I suppose I could stab her in the neck. But well, I think the M80 firecracker is the weapon of choice. Oh, what are you going to do with that? Well, I think you have to um, shove it down the front of her dress <laughs> and set it off, because otherwise, how are you going to get rid of her? All right, well, unfortunately, that commotion got the attention of one Sir Christopher Lee Dracula who comes out of the room and attacks you. Now, Jonathan Harker, he didn't do that well against him. He uh, got No, got he, got, he got thrown around. But maybe I'll wait with the firecracker. Maybe I'll wait until Dracula comes in the room. Okay, so and she's then, still all in one piece. Well, no, then I'll, then I'll be bitten. But let's face it, I'm going to get bitten anyway. You're probably because it's bitten. part of the story. Yeah. So I'm bitten, and now I throw the, the firecracker at Dracula when he comes in. Did you remember to light it? No, I may not remember. Oh, no. Oh, man. Besides, he'll probably just kick it away. <laughs> Probably just, yeah, like swatted away. Yeah, it looks like I'm doomed. You, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's all over for me. I think you're the first person we played this game with who's like, no, I wouldn't make it. <laughs>
<laughs> but hey, man, with Christopher Lee attacking you, what are you supposed to do? Like, well, I would, you know, he's got a lot of sequels to make, so I don't want to make them one. <laughs> That's right. Uh, what have you been up to lately? I believe you've been working with I, uh, If I was Garris. doing anything, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, no, I'm doing my usual stuff. I've got Trailers from Hell going on and all that thing. I've got a new podcast, yeah. uh, The Movies That Made Me which I just did one uh, last weekend with William Friedkin. Oh, and it's, um, it, it's not the usual podcast. They don't just come on and talk about their work. They come on and talk about the movies that, that made them want to make movies. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've had Ron Perlman and uh, Ernest Dickerson, a lot of really good people. That's and you fun. mentioned Trailers from Hell? And trailers from Hell, you know, yeah. we, we record a couple times a year. And every week we put up three trailers. And the idea, hopefully, is to familiarize people with movies they might not know about. And then you directed a segment of uh, Mick Garris' film? Mick Garris uh, produced a show called Nightmare Cinema, which is um, a series of uh, short bits wrapped up with a, a framing story, much like the Anarchist pictures or Dead of Night. Uh, and Mick's ideal was to get all overseas directors. Mm -hmm. But in order to get the picture made, he needed two Americans, so I said I would do one. Oh great! Uh, it's been very, it's been well received, and I think I think we finally found the distributor. So I think yeah. you, you're seeing it fairly soon. And thank you so much for having us into your home and for this awesome conversation and for the lalas. No, that's great. So you're you're gonna clean up, right? Oh yeah, I got it. I got it okay. for you. Yeah, as long as you don't mind me just uh, peeking around at all your awesome stuff in here. No, no, that's fine. Just uh, the garbage disposal's over there. Okay, and uh, or any, you can take this home. Any soap preference on the dishes or uh, any soap? Well, I yeah. usually lick them clean, or I have the cat though. Oh, cat. Okay, cool. I'll pet, I'll pet her while she does it. <laughs> Thanks again, Jeff. Yeah, thanks. Really appreciate it. Watch new vids every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Only on Crypt TV.